I grew up in southern Appalachia in western North Carolina, 30 minutes outside the town of Asheville. The hills and hollers of the Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest mountains in the world, with some of the rock formations dating back over a billion years. That quite literally means they were here before there were terrestrial animals. As with most things that have been on Earth for a long time, there are inexplicable anomalies both benevolent and malevolent. For example, the brown mountain lights. Never in my life have I felt threatened or uneasy when witnessing them from Wiseman's view. They're neither good nor evil, they just are. On the benevolent side, sometimes you can walk through an abandoned old church up near my mom and dad's property and you can feel a good, warm, happy energy. It's like that first warm day of summer when the sunshine is not too hot, but not too cold either. Well, this story is not about one such anomaly. It's about something that's definitely malevolent. About a decade ago, I was in night school at the AB Tech, going to school for automotive mechanics. I would go into class about 2 p.m. after I got off my part-time job, and I would end up getting home about 10.30, depending on the traffic, that is. Every night I drove the same road in my old 1973 W200 Dodge pickup. Some nights it would get rather boring, and I would take a different route, jump off of I-40 and drive the back roads. On this particular evening, I had decided to just stay on the I-40 because I just wanted to get home and go to bed. It was Thursday, and there was no class on Friday. I wanted to get in bed early so I could go up in the woods and go hiking early tomorrow morning and watch the sun come up. As I jumped off the I-40 onto the exit where my parents lived, the night seemed to get darker, and none of the animals that I could hear through my rolled-down windows made any more noise. The cab of my truck became smaller and smaller, and my breath quickened. I've never faced any kind of anxiety in my life, but at that moment, something felt off, and there was no way I could put my finger on what it was. I came to a stop on the exit ramp, turned to go down the road, and happened to notice that the gas station off the exit where Mom and Dad lived had no lights on. They were a 24-hour truck stop and always had lights on, but I didn't think about it again after noticing. I just chalked it up to a power outage, but I could not shake the feeling that something was definitely askew. I slowly shifted through all the old truck gears, not wanting to make any more noise than an old pickup truck already did. I leaned over my steering wheel to look up at the moon through the windshield, and there was barely any stars visible, which was way out of the ordinary. If you've ever been to Appalachia, primarily the sparsely populated areas where I'm from, you can see the Milky Way on a clear night. An absence of stars back home is only due to cloud cover, or whatever in the hell went on this particular night. As I rounded a particularly sharp left-hand curve and chugged through a straight stretch before the next right-hander, I looked at the ancient, decaying barn I always gazed at when riding that stretch of road and thought about how long that thing had been here and how many advancements and civilizations it had seen. For the split second that my gaze wandered, a very large, sickly-looking dog ran out in front of my truck, no more than ten feet in front of me. Old Betsy was a good truck, but she didn't stop well. Thump, thump. I heard the fence post I had left in my truck bounce up in the bed and then back into it as I slid to a stop. My first thought was, oh God, now I have to go tell these neighbors that I ran over their dog. That shit doesn't go real far with people around here. It can really kinda set them off depending on the dog and the person. As I sat there breathing in the smell of burning rubber, something else found its way into my nose, the stench of rotting flesh. It's not a smell you ever forget once you smell it one time. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time, I just chalked it up to some rotting roadkill nearby. Finally, I thought to myself, let me check and see who this dog belongs to. I pushed my clutch in, shifted to reverse, and as I looked in my rearview mirror, illuminated by the haunting glow of my reverse lamps, was the same dog, only it wasn't on four legs anymore. It stood up, like a man, a man over 10 feet tall. Only then did it dawn on me that the front of my truck was every bit of five feet tall, and this dog was every bit of five feet tall at the shoulders on all fours. As it turned its head to look in the direction of my truck, 
I caught only a glimpse of this creature. It was not a dog. It certainly was not a man. It was somewhere in between, and at the same time, entirely separate altogether. Its skin hung loose off its emaciated frame, like a raccoon. Bits of matted fur and dirt and mud clung to its legs like a disease. The right arm seemed a little bit longer than the left, and they both hung abnormally low in relation to either animal this creature seemed to be. As it regained its senses, it turned and looked into the mirror like it knew exactly where I was sitting. The face was that of a man, but the very edges of its face seemed not to be totally defined. They seemed to move and change like something you could see at a cellular level in a scientific documentary. There were, there were no eyes, but only sockets where eyes should be. No hair either, and the skin that was dripping off its face was a cold, lifeless gray color. The nose was short and shoved into its face like a bulldog, but the teeth, the teeth still haunt me. It was definitely carnivorous, and true to form, the rest of its unnatural look, many of its teeth didn't seem to be arranged in a natural way in its mouth. They seemed to fill and spill forth from the undefinable face, almost like they knew the horror they occupied and they were searching for a way out. It stared through my life, into my eyes and past my soul. It seemed like an eternity, but, but it could not have been more than five seconds that I sat there paralyzed. A light came on at the house next to the road, causing the creature to snap its gaze in that direction tear off into the woods on its back two legs. I jammed my old truck into first gear and roasted tires all the way through first, snatched second, and drove as fast as I could home. When I got to the house, both my parents were asleep. I went downstairs into my bedroom and loaded every firearm I possessed and locked all the doors. I couldn't wake them up. Who would believe that? And at 10.30 on a Thursday night... The basement was eerily quiet that night. Even their dog that got up to raise hell outside if any animal came close was dead silent. The old post and beam house didn't even creak or pop that night, as was usual. At about 3 a.m., I finally started to get drowsy, and as I went to lay my head down and get some sleep so I could still attempt to go hiking the next morning, I smelled the stench of death again. It was faint at first, but... It was definitely there. I thought to myself, you're just going crazy. None of that was real. But as I dwelt on it, it became more and more noticeable until it filled the entire basement. My dad has a home office in the basement with two large glass doors that face the Pisgah National Forest, an impenetrable 500,000 acre wood. I finally worked up the courage to walk out of my bedroom and into the basement's living area with my little tactical 12 gauge loaded tack light on. I covered the flashlight with my hand so as not to make my presence known until it needed to be. And as I turned right out of the living room into my dad's office, I shined the light through the glass doors and at the edge of the woods, there stood the creature. It was motionless. It stared right into the light, unafraid with those soulless sockets devoid of eyes. I quickly covered my tack light ran into the living room and flipped on the outside floodlights in my surprise. But it was no longer standing at the edge of the woods, but between the house and the edge of the woods, still motionless. I swung the door open and fired every round I had in its direction. I must have scored a couple of hits because it screeched an unearthly scream, like that of a woman being slaughtered as it took to the woods. The dog went crazy. Mom and Dad woke up asking what the hell I was doing. I told them that a bear had gotten into the trash and I was scaring it away. They didn't believe me, but I know they wouldn't believe the truth either. I didn't sleep that night or any time until the following Sunday. Everything seemed to return to normal and I didn't think about the creature again until I met my wife about six years ago. Her mother's house sits at the mouth of the holler, no more than four or five miles up the road from my mother and father's house. Up on the side of the holler, there's a kennel for her brother's hunting dogs. No longer in use, and hasn't been for years, but the fence is still there, and the concrete pads are still there. It's a thing of great use when you need to quarantine an animal. 
Her Great Pyrenees had gotten into a tussle with a raccoon, which of course he destroyed, but his rabies vaccine had lapsed, so we had to keep him quarantined for a time. It didn't bother him, he kinda liked solitude. This particular night, we were coming home from a movie date in the neighboring town, was the last night of quarantine for him. So we walked up the trail, using our phone flashlights to get to the kennel, and there he sat, patiently waiting, tail wagging, happy to see us. We put him on a leash and started walking him back towards the house with us. As we were walking back through the darkness, I started to feel that same feeling I'd felt the night I hit the creature in my truck. I didn't say anything so as not to alarm my wife, but when the smell came wafting in on the breeze, she jokingly asked me, My God, what did you eat? You stink. I half laughed, not being able to fully appreciate the joke for the horror that raged in my mind. She immediately caught on and asked what was wrong, to which I could only reply, I'll tell you later. She grew up in the woods and around hunting and things of that nature her whole life, so she knew what I meant. She knew we were being watched by something. When we could see the lights of the house from the trail to the kennel, we heard it. There came barking from the kennel that sound just like the Great Pyrenees we had on a leash next to us. It was a perfect imitation. The Pyrenees being a guardian dog immediately sensed that something was wrong, and so we turned to face the danger, belting out a deep bark and growl in that direction. I don't know if you've ever had to drag a 150 pound dog, but it sucks and it's no easy task. I'm six feet, 240 pounds, and it was all I could do to get him back in the house. The barking never ceased the entire time we were running for the house. In fact, it seemed to grow closer and closer, till it seemed it was coming from inside my own head. Her mother heard the commotion and flipped the floodlights on, and we made it to the fence of the yard as I caught a glimpse of something coming to a dead stop at the end where the lights reached, wheeling around and tearing off into the darkness. My wife looked at me and said, You want to tell me what the hell that was? To which I replied, Yes let's go inside. I told her the story and she listened intently, hanging on to every word. Her family came from a long line of granny witches and other supernatural healers from Appalachia, so her older sister came over the next morning with some herbs and chants to bless the property and to ward off evil. I suggested we go up to the dog kennels and do them as well. When we got to the kennels, they were completely destroyed. The very concrete foundation was cracked and the chain link fence was torn off its post. The dog houses were destroyed and the place reeked of the stench that followed that creature. My wife's older sister just went about her business like normal, blessed the place, burnt some herbs, and led us back to the property. When we got into the house, she wheeled about on us suddenly and instructed us very firmly to never go into the woods after dark, not until this thing left me alone. To make a long story short, my wife joined the military and she ended up getting stationed in Delaware. Well, as someone who lived around fairly large mountains and endless wilderness their entire life, Delaware is pretty terrible. At least, that was my thought when we first moved into the middle of a 50,000 plus population city. Fortunately though, it didn't take long to find a house in a sleepy little community further south. We purchased the house and moved in with haste. We were both very grateful and glad to be out of the city and into a rural setting again. The land in Delaware seems lifeless in comparison to Appalachia. The sparsely populated woods don't possess any energy that goes one way or its other. The ground doesn't seem to be alive like it is in Appalachia. Having had no thoughts about the creature in a long time, I resume my staying outside after dark and playing with our dogs in a rather large yard that bordered on a small patch of woods. Well, last night I went outside to play with the dogs and as dark set in, I built a decent sized fire in my fire pit and consumed some good old fashioned Appalachian Mountain cough syrup from a mason jar. And just as the fire was dying down, my American bulldog tore off towards the woods. He has a habit of running off to go on adventures, so my immediate instinct was to chase him down in the yard and tackle him so he couldn't get away. As I tackled his 110 pound ass to the ground and threw him in a fireman's carry over my shoulder, I heard him begin to bark, only the bark wasn't coming from him. The only sound coming from him was a deep rumbling growl, a noise I've never heard him make before. It was a threatening noise, something was definitely wrong, and as I ran with him on my shoulder back to the house, the stench of death 
again began to fill the air. The other two dogs must have caught the wind and what was happening, and met me at the back door which I threw open, slammed shut, and locked as I again began to load firearms. How the hell could this thing have followed us 650 miles up here? As I flipped the floodlights on at the back side of the house, several of the bushes and small trees at the forest's edge were still shaking like something had just run through them. My dogs went crazy all night, barking and howling and attempting to get out of the windows. I didn't sleep a bit, and I don't think I will for a while. I know for sure I won't be in the woods after dark again. Not in life. Not until this thing is gone. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. No, no, don't worry. This isn't another Appalachian Grandpa story. This is from a user, SubAruglian, on Reddit, who also seems to have a love for Appalachia, just like yours truly. If you've been with the channel long, you know that I love the Appalachian area, and I love Appalachian folklore. I hope to make it back there one day. When he talks about Delaware, and he says that the land seems lifeless in comparison to Appalachia, I know that feeling all too well. That's how the Florida sand feels when I sink my toes into it. Just not quite as good as that thick Georgia clay that I'm used to. But anyway, I'll stop waxing poetic and go ahead and thank my sponsors. Thanks to Leslie Lou Riddle and Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Zoronan for being our ghostly reader contributor. And thanks to Glenn Jenkins for being our ghostly writer contributor. Thanks, everybody. We just couldn't do it without you. If you too would like to support the show, come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you can be part of our spooky skeleton tier army and have your name read out at the end of every TikTok and every YouTube video that I do. Spooky skeleton tier contributors and up also get their videos a day early. So... Have your Wednesday video on Tuesday and your Friday video on Thursday. If you enjoy what we do here, I'm sure you can find some other videos at the end. Why not go ahead and watch one? Maybe think about subscribing, hitting that bell so you don't miss a single video. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.